Okay. <laughs> Great. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, my name is Joe Miller, and I'm the founder and host of the Washington Tech Policy Podcast. I like to think of the podcast as a mobile think tank, giving the tech community in a weekly update on all of the national level tech policy developments they need to know, uh, plus an interview with leading folks affecting tech policy. My interview with Wayne Sutton is episode number 40, and you can find it on Apple, on iTunes, uh, Google Play, um, and Stitcher. So the, the focus of this panel is looking at the intersection of tech policy and diversity. A few years ago, Washington and Silicon Valley were like night and day, and the tech sector would avoid Washington like the plague. Today, though, things have changed. Now, according to the Center for Responsive Politics, the tech sector outpaces Wall Street by a factor of more than two to one in terms of lobbying investment within the Beltway. On top of this, the current environment of repeated hacking and intrusions into critical infrastructure, some of which have been designed to undermine our electoral process, underscores the need for tech workers who can serve on the front lines of, of cybersecurity. Our national security depends on a diverse workforce with the skills to defend American interests here and abroad. And part of that means looking at what local governments are doing right and scaling that to the national level. So my guests today are Colin Lakin, Siri Thanasabat, Laura Weidman Powers, and Tony Williams. Colin Lakin is currently the mayor's director for strategic partnerships for Mayor Ed Lee in the city and county of San Francisco. His responsibility includes creating, coordinating, and facilitating public-private partnerships for the benefit of the residents of San Francisco. Previously, Mr. Lakin served for 10 years as the president and CEO of Northern California Grant Makers, which is the regional, the, uh, regional association of grant makers with approximately 200 member organizations and individuals working to support and strengthen its members and promote effective philanthropy in the region. Mr. Lakin holds a Master's of Science in Financial Management and Policy from Carnegie Mellon and a Bachelor's from Cornell, and he's a professional instructor at UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. Siri Thanasambat is a trial attorney for the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission based in San Francisco and Los Angeles, California, where she litigates employment discrimination cases and multiple claimant civil rights lawsuits. She's a graduate of New York University School of Law, where she was a Root Tilden Kern Fellow and an editor for the NYU Law Review. Laura Weidman Powers is Senior Policy Advisor to the U.S. Chief Technology Officer within the White House. In this role, Powers focuses on issues of diversity and inclusion in tech. In tech. Specifically, she focuses on efforts related to ensuring hiring, entrepreneurship, and the products and platforms of the future work for all Americans, particularly those from historically marginalized backgrounds. Tony Williams currently serves as the Senior Director of Government and External Affairs for Comcast NBC Universal. A former speechwriter and policy advisor, Tony's work at Comcast has focused on developing relationships, communication strategies, and community outreach campaigns that engage and excite people with technology and media. He's dedicated himself to fostering organizations that engage kids in their education, uh, serving on the board of the Children's Literacy Initiative, Philadelphia Young Playwrights, and the Philadelphia Youth Poetry Movement. So if we could just have a warm welcome for our guests. <laughs> So we'll start, with, um, we'll start with Laura. Laura, you've inspired countless young people and countless others to pursue their dreams via the use of, of technology. W what are some of the key challenges that you've found among the diverse talent you've worked with? And you know, specifically, what advice do you find yourself giving over and over when you're advising folks on how to overcome the barriers they face? Um, thank, thanks for having us. Um, this is uh, a really exciting topic that I think uh, I never even thought about until a few months ago. Um, so I'm at the White House now. Um, I know uh, some of you from the, my uh, non-US government world, uh, where I co-founded and run Code2040, and um, through that have worked with 
uh, hundreds of students, dozens of entrepreneurs, and had the opportunity to jump over to the policy side about three months ago. And a big part of why that was interesting and exciting to me was because a lot of what we saw and see at Code 2040 is that it's not about the individual. It's not that there's something wrong with folks that's not allowing them to get into the tech sector. We're really talking about systems issues. And if you think about what um, the tools are that are available when you're talking about policy and government, it's really thinking about how you change systems, um, which then impacts the experience that individuals have. So a big part of what we were seeing was a disconnect in the networks that are sort of the incumbents in the tech sector and then the folks who um, need that access in order to get their companies off the ground or get that first opportunity um, at a company. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs start out by getting work experience in the tech industry first. Um, you hear it every time a company uh, grows and has a successful exit, then the individuals who are working at that company kind of jump out on their own, start a bunch of new companies based on their experience kind of seeing that path. So if you think about um, the desire and the opportunity to grow the tech industry, to have it be more diverse, to have more diverse leadership, more inclusive cultures, a lot of times that really starts from the top. And what better way than to have a more inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem? And a big part of that is making sure that the networks of individuals who um, need that first job, that first opportunity in order to get the experience and exposure, in order to build the network, that they have that chance. Um, and so a big part of what the president has charged us with and what the administration is working on is how we think about getting those who are the incumbents to open up their networks and open up those opportunities so that more people have that first, um, that first shot. We'll turn it over to Colin Lake. And Colin, you're a long-term public servant in both uh, Oakland and San Francisco. So you, more than most, have seen the big picture. You served as the assistant director of the mayor of Oakland's Office of Drugs and Crime. You've worked on the legislative side. You've worked on health and safety issues. Can, uh, can you tell us a bit about your unique vantage point and how these different experiences have informed the way you develop strategic partnerships for the, uh, for the mayor of San Francisco? Thanks, Joe, and good morning, everyone. Glad to be here with you today. Um, I, I think the uniques of my, uniqueness of my past roles is that it's given me an opportunity to sort of sit in two worlds. And, and I'm going to make, bring that back together in a second. But the, the two worlds are um, the government sector, which has its own language, its, its own way of thinking of things, always driven by trying to make the citizenry and the community stronger and better, but has its own way of, of, of operating. And then you have uh, sort of the nonprofit and philanthropic world um, that has a whole set of different types of language. On one end of the nonprofit sector, it's sort of service and and uh, delivery of opportunities and connections between communities, but on the other end of that spectrum is the giving part, the part that is looking for uh, ways to invest and how to go do that. Uh, bringing those things together, what my background allows me to do is to help communicate across those in a better way. Uh, what we've found is that uh, often, wanting to have the same goals, but the communication just doesn't occur. And so being able to have worked uh, in local government and state government and understand sort of how it operates, how that bureaucracy works, how do you get that agenda sort of moving and translating that for both the corporate and the nonprofit sector and then vice versa. So that's the bridge that, 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 I, that I see that I sort of bring a value to. The piece that I want to connect around uh, the tech world is that uh, obviously um, in the environment and in the community that we're in right now, uh, tech opportunities, tech jobs, uh, tech capacity is really, really important. And so being able to bring both the frustrations and the challenges that government may have to not be able to move as quickly as tech or to be able to build those bridges in that communication role, what I'm trying to do is share with tech what those needs are and how they might be of value to be able to do that. On the flip side, for the nonprofit sector and in serving different communities, I'm trying to bring to the tech 
community a sense of you're moving your agenda and your industry, but here are social civic ways in which you might be able to, in, to be engaged with the communities in which you're located and ways that you might leverage that so that you might get benefit both for the business but also strengthen the community in the same way. Now, Laura, when you founded Code 2040, it was based here in, in San Francisco, did you notice things about the city of San Francisco that they're doing right that you'd like to see on a more national basis? You know, I think one of the things that was appealing to us about being in San Francisco when we started Code 2040 was that it felt like you could get access to Silicon Valley, you could get access to Oakland, and you could get access to um, what was happening right in our backyard. And being able, there's so much innovation happening across the entirety of the Bay Area, being in a place where we could see all of that and tap into all of that felt really important. And I think creating bridges between those different communities, whether it's um, figuring out how to get people across the bridge or down the highway for meetups um, so that there aren't those silos across those different uh, kind of pockets of innovation is one of the challenges and opportunities that um, is true here and I think is true in a lot of cities around the country. Um, Code 2040 works in Chicago as well and similarly there's several different innovative hubs in Chicago. How do we make sure that those are new together so that you don't end up having a scenario where there's different kind of places that are home for innovation from different pockets of the community without connecting those. Because if there's so much more chance for accelerating what is working when there's more visibility into those different um, communities and those different buckets despite kind of geographic disconnectedness. I want to turn it over to you know, the couple of issues that we mentioned at the top were the issues of um, cybersecurity and then the issue of um, the tech sector's increasing influence um, in Washington. Um, we had a panel with the House Education um, and Workforce Committee a few weeks ago where we discussed um, an executive order that requires affirmative action in, um, in the hiring of uh, government um, contractors. So I want to, I want to turn over my, my next question to Siri. Um, Siri, back in May, the EEOC released a, a report on diversity in the, in the tech space. Would you tell us a bit more about this, the significant findings of, of that report? Sure. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for having um, the EEOC here today. Um, the EEOC, you guys might be confused and confuse us with the EEO departments, EEO departments in your companies. Uh, we are actually a federal rights agency. Um, that enforce federal laws against employment discrimination and harassment. Um, we uh, investigate, we mediate, we litigate um, and educate on these issues and um, we believe prevention is uh, much better than a cure. So thank you so much for having us here, represented here today. Um, back to your question, Joe, as to um, our latest report on diversity in high tech. Um, I think a lot of people, in a lot of people's minds, there's a stereotype of when you think of, of tech, you think of you know, maybe a, a, a programmer, you th and this programmer might be white or possibly Asian, but they're pretty much going to probably be male in the public's mind, and this is, I know, a stereotype. Um, but I think what people, um, what the EOC report found was that in the high tech industry, we, they cover a lot of job categories. Um, you have accountants, you have HR folks, you have administrative officers um, that, are, that are part of this industry. Um, and the, the lack of diversity invades all of these job categories. Okay, um, so reporting, so this report looks at these sp specific findings um, because if you don't see a problem clearly, you can't effectively address the problem. Um, so just kind of uh, to go over the report a little bit, section one talks, provides a literature review on the high tech industry. Um, sec second section looks at some, some, uh, some data that we uh, were able to call from 2014 data from the census, uh, EO, uh, sorry, EO1 data. And some of the things that we found in, in calling that um, data was number one, um, in the high tech sector, 
whites, Asian Americans, and men were uh, extremely overrepresented in this field. Um, however, African Americans, Hispanic, and, and women were severely underrepresented in this industry. I don't think that's surprising to folks. Um, uh, but you can take a look at the, the little uh, the uh, report in detail a little bit. But I think what was a little more surprising was in the executive um, uh, sector, um, whites were represented at a higher rate. So 83.3 percent of the executives in in high tech were white. Um, however, uh, for other groups like Asian Americans, Hispanics, and um, African Americans, the percentage was. For example, two percent, three point one percent, and then ten percent. So that was that was kind of eye-opening a little bit to a certain extent. Um, so you saw an overrepresentation of over fifteen percentage points for whites, and then an underrepresentation uh, for the other categories. Um, and then our third, the third section in our report looks at just the top seventy-five Silicon Valley tech firms, and this is defined by um, I think the Mercury. Was San Jose Mercury News? They did an analysis of the top 75 firms. So we looked at their data. We looked at who they hired, who they're um, retaining, um, and we found out that 57% um, of their executives were white. Only 36% of their executives were Asian Americans. 1.6% of their executives were Hispanic, and less than 1% uh, were African Americans. Um, so, so you're looking at not just only getting people in, but moving people up. And I think that's, a, that's, that's been a prevalent problem in the tech sector. Thank you. So I want to turn it over to uh, Tony Williams. Tony, you were part of the team that created Comcast Universal's, Comcast NBC Universal's Internet Essentials program, which today is one of the largest, if not the largest, broadband adoption programs in the country. Can you give us some insight into how the program came about, challenges you faced along the way? And yeah, ha happy to, Joe. So um, for those of you guys who don't know, Comcast Internet Essentials Program, uh, as Joe mentioned, so the, world, uh, the country's largest broadband adoption program started in 2011. And really what it did is it looked at some research that had come out of the FCC and out of Pew that really said that you know, when you look at who's not adopting broadband, it's low-income families, it's minor minorities largely, it's uh, folks who are from rural areas. And when you look at it, there are sort of three main buckets, three main reasons they're not connecting to the internet, not embracing, if you would, some of these new technologies. One is a, a cost issue, and that's the cost of the device as well as the service. But then also, it's about digital literacy and really a fear, if you would, a comfortability with using that technology. So what we did is we created uh, the Internet Central program to address all three of those barriers. So we, it's low cost, it's $9.95 for the service. You can get a computer for under $150, and then we built in a digital literacy training, and we began to work with community organizations, governments, to really get the program out there. So today we have about 750,000 families of almost 3 million Americans who are connected through the program. To give you a sense of that size, if it was an American city, it would be the large, larger than all but two American cities, and if it was a state, it would be larger than 21 Amer uh, U.S. states. So, you know, it's really had a dramatic impact. Um, you know, you talk about the challenges and things that we learned. So, Laura talked a little bit about approaching the problem from the top down, if you would. How do you address sort of companies, get more folks into companies to that uh, exist today? This is really about the bottom up. And so this is how do you build for the future. And the biggest thing that when you look at how do you build for the future, it is both broadband adoption, but then also the key of that is the digital literacy training we found was the most important thing. Actually, um, there were some folks who were just waiting for the price drop. Those folks joined very quickly. The hard thrust was really working with cities, community groups, governments, to then educate folks and teach them what they could do online, get them comfortable online, so that they uh, prioritize that and moved up the, their priority list. That's, that, that transfers, and it's the same challenge that we now see even when you move beyond basic digital literacy to STEM and education, right? So, and it's that same challenge when you look at where we can have the most impact driving diversity, again, not today, but 20 years from now, 
It's about how can government, particularly municipal governments who often have control uh, of their education departments and state governments too who direct a lot of that funding, how can they partner, work with companies, work with um, the federal government, other folks to really institute these STEM programs so that the folks who are trained are not just folks who go to the you know, private schools or go to you know, uh, wealthy suburban schools, but folks who are in our cities, who are in our low income communities so that they can be creators, they can be owners, they can be drivers of the next generation. Great, thanks Tony. Uh, so, and tell us, tell us about how Comcast supports um, in addition to the broadband access, how does Comcast support diverse startups that are, that are looking for funding? Yeah, happy to. So, I mean, the, the easy, or the, the top level answer is we have something called Comcast Ventures, and it's a you know, VC firm similar to um, the thing, you know, a number of other ones. As part of that, we have something called the Catalyst Fund, and the Catalyst Fund is very, its sole focus is to invest in startups uh, led by minorities, women, underrepresented um, owners. And so they have uh, invested in, I think, 15 to, to 20 startups at, at this point. They continue. Uh, but we've also found not only have they been investing in helping uh, these entrepreneurs get started, but we've also been creating new talent. So Lo Tony, who's now with Go Google Ventures, came through and was part of Comcast Ventures originally. And so we, we're starting to diversify, if you would, that pipeline of talent of uh, folks who are in the VC industry as well. But the, the biggest thing that Comcast has done is we took a risk, and we took a risk on, on two fronts. One, we sort of put our money where our mouth was on the procurement side, and people often overlook procurement because it's sort of from, if you would, an older industry practice and, and not sort of sexy, but that's really about where do these big companies spend our money? Where do we uh, create partnerships? And so we started first with tier one suppliers, and now we've gone to tier two suppliers and we're the first tech and telecommunications company to be part of the billion dollar round table. Um, since 2011, I think we've spent $8 billion uh, with tier one suppliers. And uh, since 20, I think 12, end of 2012, we've spent about 900 million with tier two suppliers. And so we're, we're expanding that, but that's all about, again, how do we partner with other companies who are led by diverse individuals owned and operated and how do we bring them into that ecosystem? How do we actually spend our dollars with them to make, uh, grow their business? And then as part of that, we also have something called our entrepreneurial engagement team whose sole mission is actually to spend time with diverse startups, diverse companies, so that you can have that interaction, that brainstorming, if you would, that almost that commiseration about what's working, what's not working, what's around the corner um, so you can explore partnerships, explore opportunities. So when, it, when we are ready to launch into whatever tomorrow's technology is, they're at the table and their, their technology, their solutions, their companies can be a part of that conversation. So for entrepreneurs in the room, where can they go to find out information about how to get, get uh, support? So you, you, can, you can Google Comcast Entrepreneurial Engagement and you will find the page. You can uh, email me, Antonio underscore Williams at Comcast.com and I'm happy to connect you with our, with our teams there. Um, either one of those ways are, are great ways to, uh, to connect with the team. Okay, I want to uh, turn it over to the audience, see if the audience has um, any questions for our panelists. Thanks. A few years ago when the merger happened with NBC and Comcast, a number of provisions were put in place to help minority programming and the broadband um, activities you talked about. And coming up now, we're looking at an AT&T and Time Warner merger. And I'm wondering if there's anything either industry or regulators can do to make sure that people with disabilities are included in the provisions that will come out of that and previous mergers. So, um, you know, I mean, I think, I think the, the answer is that it goes through a process of review. We went through a process both at the DOJ and the FCC. And so the conditions that came out of that deal were part of essentially a negotiation that happens between the company and uh, those government entities. And so for the AT&T merger, I don't know if they figured out where that will be. I think they're looking at just DOJ right now, but the FCC will obviously have input as will the White House and other folks. So I think it's, that, it's through that government process 
um, that any conditions any um, are, are both that would be placed on that deal. Is this on? Oh. Hi, I was just in the other um, lightning talk with um, Leslie Miley, one of my heroes, and he was saying how, you know, if tech wants to solve the diversity challenge, it should locate in Atlanta, Detroit, Richmond, Virginia, which I totally agree with. But the Bay Area is actually the second most diverse region in the entire United States. So why is it, what, what can really be done to bridge between the local diverse community and the tech sector jobs right here. Why is that not happening? Mm -hmm. So I think the question was uh, something along the lines of sort of taking a more local focus on, the, on city re residents in San Francisco. Which program in Richmond were you, were, were you referring to? I'm not familiar with that program. Uh, Richmond, Virginia. There's a, are you referring to a particular program in No, in Leslie Miley, and I've heard a lot of folks in the tech diversity talk about this, that we need to locate tech companies in these diverse cities, like Detroit, like Richmond, Virginia, like Atlanta. Okay. Which I agree with. Okay. But what I'm saying is that why, we have diversity right here in the Bay Area. We are the second most ethnically and racially diverse region in the entire United States of America. We've been a majority people of color region in a majority people of color state since the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So why isn't tech answering its diversity challenge right here in the Bay Area? So Colin, can you, can you speak to um, you know, why, why um, the how the tech sector is including San Francisco, the city of San Francisco in, it, in sort of its uh, global diversity and inclusion efforts? Sure, I, I think I understand your question and it very much relates to your, your, your question that you just asked. Um, first of all, the challenges. Obviously, across the country, we're having some key challenges, but in the city of San Francisco, these won't surprise you. The big issues that come up all the time are housing, homelessness, education, and jobs. And that relates very much to what you're, you're basically asking. So in that capacity, um, engaging the tech community around those particular issues because the disparities of the low income or, or um, uh, communities of color are much, much higher dis disparities in their access to any of those particular areas that we were just talking about. And therefore there is, and we see, uh, a little bit of a push out of, of those communities and those families. And so to your question that's related to this, um, we as a city are really engaging the tech community and saying, look, you have two ends of this that you need to work on. One end is, is your employment and your engagement of diversity within your companies, and we want to push for that. We want to push for your recruiting practices, we want to push for, for your uh, attraction and, and your retention policies to be able to engage those communities. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, for you to be successful and for us to be successful, we have to sort of seed those programs earlier on. And so we are bridging the tech community to our educational programs. Um, the, the tech community has become very involved in our middle school programs and our early education programs. Tony talked a little bit ab uh, about um, sort of the math and science efforts that we're, we're engaging them in. The second is those issues, those higher issues that I talked about don't, aren't usually seen as tech issues, but they are. Housing isn't just the issue of the tech folks who want to come and work here and can't afford to live here, but the folks who are here are having those struggles as well. So we're really engaging the tech community in terms of what are the new options in terms of providing housing? How do we lower housing opportunities? How do we create tech investment in the opportunities that keep, keep middle and low income? And then lastly, the area of, of the homelessness stuff that we were talking about, family homelessness in particular. And we're engaging the, the tech community around this particular issue. And in fact, three big tech companies are leading it. One of them is uh, sales Force are uh, really engaging in, in saying how might they, in, in either in volunteerism or in pr providing resources or dollars, help us to sort of move that agenda in a way. And in fact, we're going to announce very soon an effort that will reduce family homelessness to what we call an appropriate zero um, in, in the city of San Francisco. So, so I think that's some of the ways in which we as a city can influence and push the tech community to do that. But your question is really about if it's here, why don't they using that diversity? And I would just say that, that we are pushing them to do that. The flip side of that is that the access of those individuals is a, is a big challenge as well. And so we're trying to sort of figure out how do we create a better bridge for that access. 
Did I, I par did I paraphrase your, your question correctly? Did you, okay. Can I just can I add? Yeah, I think I would I would add to that. It's a it's a really important point because it demonstrates that um, just by locating in a certain place, it doesn't mean that the problem is solved. It's not that simple, and I think some of that has to do with. Um, the ways that tech companies, and frankly, it's not specific to tech, but the way that companies tend to recruit, mm -hmm. and the way that they tend to equate entry level with university, mm -hmm. um, which means that recruiting is about going out to campuses around the country, which is terrific, and is not comprehensive mm -hmm. of all the ways to think about talent. And there are organizations, Year Up is a great example of an organization that um, helps to change the way that companies think about access to entry level talent and to think much more locally. And locating, um, kind of creating tech ecosystems, supporting tech ecosystems in diverse cities around the country is a must. Um, and it requires being really thoughtful about how your company interacts with the community and what it means to locate in a place and engage. Could I add to that too, Joe? The EOC. Um, the EOC is also trying to tackle this very persistent um, problem of, of getting access, getting entrance to this field. And um, there's a few things that we're doing right now. We've just updated our systemic priorities, um, one of which is looking carefully at the um, online application process. You know, does for, with regards to disability and age, does this online application process, does that amplify barriers? to access and entrance. Um, a second priority that we're looking at is uh, big data, like data-driven selection processes. When you take you know, data scraping, you're looking at algorithms in order to hire, pe you know, in order to hire people. Uh, is, that, is that a double-edged sword? Are you promoting bias? Are you replicating bias? You know, when you're just looking at education levels or whatever, schools, are you replicating bias out there, are you actually being, you know, quote unquote neutral and objective about it? Um, another uh, thing we're looking at is barriers, of course, to diversity and uh, our chair, Chair Jenny Yang and uh, General Counsel David Lopez came out to Silicon Valley and had a convening with um, some high tech firms to see what the barriers are in getting access to folks of color. Um, we're also looking at systemic harassment. So now you get people in, why are people leaving? Why is there such a high attrition rate? Right? Harassment is a big issue. It's persistent and pervasive, even in our age, even in the Bay Area. So we want to look at that, and we have look at that, looked at that. Um, there's a report out on our um, website, eeoc.gov, if you want to go there um, to check out our reports. We have a, a report on big data. We have a report on harassment. It's called Rebooting Harassment. Um, and we have a report on um, diversity in the high-tech industry. So I welcome you to look at that. I think one of the things that we um, find are, is that folks are, um, are afraid to come out. I think um, one of the speakers, one of the panel um, audience members asked me during, um, uh, during the morning session, why aren't people filing with the EEOC? Why are they not coming here? And I think the part of the problem is um, people may not know about us, um, but I think there's a real fear of retaliation, of being blackballed in the industry. Um, and also, there's a relative ease in people jumping ship and just going to another job. It's easier for me to find another job than for me to, to like survive in this hostile work environment. Um, so we, we see those problems. So a lot of the cases that come in are not the typical um, cases that you, you know, we hear about in social media or in conferences. Um, but we suspect and we know that the problems um, that are pervasive in any male, you know, dis disproportionately male or disproportionately white environment are prevalent in the tech industry. Um, so we, I think training is part of it, but I think training needs to be more than just, you know, these are the legal, this is the legal standard, and please come to us, but it needs to change the culture of the environment, and, it, and I think we talked about this bottom up, and also, I'm sorry, top down and bottom up. It needs to be in both ways. So, um, so yeah, I think the EOC can play a role in that. Yeah, and that's, that kind of speaks to the kind of the core issue, is, you know, how, how to get into those, those local communities and how to, how to identify those, um, those skills that may, it may be traditional criteria is not identifying them, but that's kind of the core, the core issue. So thanks for your question. Yes, my question is, hello? Can you hear me? 
Uh, my name is Pamela Gustav, and I'm the founder of a new startup. It's called Ride a Club. It's Rideshare Independent Drivers Alliance, and I'm an Uber and a Lyft driver, and it's a club for Uber and Lyft drivers so that we become a more prominent, um, uh, you know, more uh, recognized, rather, in the uh, rideshare economy because we're the ones that drive people around. Yet Uber calls us cars, and I know Uber is here. Um, well, I'm not a car, I'm a human, you know, and I'm a driver and I'm great. And so I decided to start, a, a, like I said, a, a club, social media networking um, startup. So I'll talk to you about that. Um, on the issue of outreach, I think we were talking about Hawaii, a lot of minorities, African Americans, underserved communities do not know about a lot of the programs is because the government, and I'm going to say it, does not do really good outreach. Mm -hmm. I said it. That's fine. You guys just don't do outreach. It's like, so you have all these companies that are, and I'm not like mad at you or anything, I'm just mad, period. <laughs> but, uh, I appreciate that. I wake up mad. No, no. <laughs> um, the thing is, is that that's the thing, because like the SBIR grants, do you know that you can get like $500,000 for every PhD that you have in your um, startup? And, and this has been going on for years and years and years, the SBIR, the STTR. One thing that a lot of people don't really know um, about innovation, I'm an OG like techie from Silicon Valley back in like 1979. <laughs> And so I used to hang out at you know Silicon Valley Entrepreneurs Club and all that. Um, I was a recruiter back then, and I also worked for Exxon Office Systems. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that a lot of the innovation that we have in our country. Pam, I want to make sure we get a question in there for. Well, I'm going to. This okay. is going to lead to a question because okay. this is really important. A lot of the innovation in our country is developed by the government, like DARPA. ARPA-E was funded with $50 million budget without, um, $50 million without a budget. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is a lot of people don't understand the process of innovation. Big companies do not just go and invest in innovation. The government invests first. Mm -hmm. And then from there, that's where all of the foundations of the technologies that we see today have come from. And guess what? That's our taxpayer dollars. Okay, whether you're on welfare or you're a worker or whatever, we pay for that innovation, yet a lot of people don't know that. And I would just like for you to speak on how can we get out that we are stakeholders in these technologies. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great note to close on. We're, we're actually running out of time. We have about three and a half minutes left. So let's try to answer that question in, in the closing remarks, starting with Colin. So uh, on the local level, um, there, there's a couple of ways. One, I, I'm, I alluded to it earlier, but I, I talked about middle school as a focus. We, as a city, identified sort of where tech companies could really have an influence in, in both sort of opening the door and showing our community and young people in particular what the opportunities are, what they look like, what benefits do you need to do that. And so we're engaging the, the, the tech companies both on a level of the technical aspects. Come and help our schools. Come and engage. We have a program called Circle the Schools where tech companies are adopting an individual school. They're coming and helping building labs. They're working with the teachers. They're paying um, teachers. Uh, they're giving teachers uh, uh, flexible funds to be able to do projects with them. And then the tech folks are coming and actually working with the students to sort of expose them to the work. On a completely different level, which we were talking a lot about is exposure, and which is your question about, is about the recruitment, is how do we engage folks? And so we've asked the tech companies in our community to one, create summer programs, to turn internships from individual one spot stop kind of recruiting from a college environment to saying, come to the local communities and say, identify, we're gonna set up shop for three months um, to, to be able to engage kids in the summer and really expose them and give them the skills and, and work to do that. Lastly, I'll say, is the volunteerism um, in, in terms of engaging um, the tech companies. If we can engage tech companies, then they understand sort of what the challenges are that these communities are actually engaged in. Great. Siri, and we'll uh, do about 30 seconds apiece. Okay, so recommendations, three recommendations for tech firms. One, check under the hood, okay? Do you know what that reference is? Okay, once you open up a, you know, a car hood, you see problems, you can't just close the hood. You gotta fix it. So if you, so the first is self-audit, you know, open the hood, check the hood. There's problems, 
fix it, commit to fixing it. Uh, second, um, bake into your company's DNA from the very start, diversity, equity, inclusion, okay? The very beginning. Don't wait till you hit you know, 100 employees. Start in the very beginning. Um, to make that a, a value of your company, because it starts from the top, right? And then third, as you work on the issues of inclusions, uh, uh, issues of inclusions, don't leave people out. So you know, diversity isn't just about the gender gap um, or equity pay. It's a, it's you want to include a lot of you know other people. So people of different races, of course, abilities, ages. Okay, age is a big deal um, in the tech industry. Um, so, you know, there's a difference between inviting people to a party, this is a saying I heard, um, and inviting them to dance with you, okay? So you can invite them to a party, let them attend, sit in the sidelines, but hey, that's very different from engaging them um, in the process and promoting them and, in, and involving them in the running of a company. Laura and Tony, can you do this in 30 seconds? I will try. Um, so I think it's really good feedback that uh, the government is all, not always that great at marketing. So I'm going to give you all quickly um, a few different initiatives to check out. So the first one is computer science for all. Um, the president has uh, charged us to make sure that all uh, students, no matter where they go to school, have the opportunity to learn computer science. And there's actually commitments for that are open until November 10th. So if you, if your company, your organization organization is working on uh, more access to computer science education, there's a great opportunity to engage with the White House there, Google CS for all. Um, tech hire, um, going back to the idea of how you connect to local talent, tech hire um, partners with cities, with private sector companies, with computer science education, uh, boot camps to ensure that folks are being um, retrained and upskilled for uh, the current economy, so check that up. Um, startup in a day run by the SBA. Um, as uh, I think a lot of us maybe have experienced, it can be very tricky to figure out what you need to actually file or do to start a company. So if you um, search startup in a day, you'll see that um, a few dozen cities have taken a pledge to make it easy to start a company in a single day. And then more broadly, I would say find folks who are in positions of leadership within government, follow them on Twitter um, and their official accounts, and they will share out these sorts of opportunities, and you'll get a chance to see ways to engage in a place where you already are. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick since I'm at the end here. Really, I, I want to steal a concept from our, our future and our, our next president, I think. And really, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton said back when she was first lady about education, it takes a village. And so when you talk about this process, it really is going to take a village. And what we need to do is move beyond silos. So we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't look at it as a city problem, as a legal problem, as a federal problem, or as a company problem. It's about how do we bring all of those groups together really to solve and tackle this challenge because there has to be that cooperation and collaboration if we're going to make, it, uh, make a real uh, dent in this. And so it means everything from education, it means investment and incentivizing private investment, incentivizing risk taking, um, so that you have new companies coming in, you have old companies uh, starting new businesses, bringing in folks, uh, and it's easier for them to both test out folks and to let them let folks who don't aren't successful go, and also promote those folks who are successful in in, the, in those companies, um, and that you can also then they're connected to those public institutions, whether they're education institutions, whether they're universities, hospitals, that are investing in that research, that are leading that next round. So again, it's moving beyond silos, it's becoming, uh, getting that collaboration and that um, teamwork together um, to work and conquer this challenge. Great, thank you. If we could have a final round of applause for our brilliant panel. <laughs>